I'm going to start off um, talking about Australia by talking a little bit about the world. Uh, this will be picked up in a little bit more detail by uh, some of my fellow panellists. But where we're starting off is a view that says the global economy is very mixed. Um, in, when you look at the commodity prices, there are clear winners and clear losers. Uh, one of the things that I think people haven't really picked up on is most of Australia's major trading partners actually benefit when commodity prices go down, particularly China and the Asian economies. If I was going to around, around the world very quickly, um, my sort of quick view would be Europe is still very poor. Um, our view would be that um, they're still worried about deflation. Um, commodity prices help Europe a little bit, uh, but at best we're expecting something like one to one and a quarter percent growth uh, this year. Japan still misfiring, uh, lots of concerns about um, what the amount of stimulus that they've put in there and got no action. If I, if I had to pick a couple of economies, though, that really matter for Australia, the two I'd pick would be the US and China. And for me, the good news is that both of those economies look pretty, pretty uh, solid. Uh, for the US, domestic demand's growing around 3%. I'll put that in context, Australian domestic demand's growing around 1%. And so the, re the real reason why unemployment's going down in the US is their domestic economy's looking pretty good. Um, and we think, as we go through the middle of this year, maybe a little bit after June, the reserve will start increasing rates. Um, China, um, Jeff's going to probably talk more about China, but I'm basically pretty relaxed about China. I think the focus is on quality of growth, slowing down um, some of the growth in housing and also slowing down some of the growth in debt. Um, China normally, if these big falls in commodity prices would actually have growth rates about half a percent higher because of the fall in commodity prices. I don't think too many of us are game enough to say that. So we're expecting growth in China somewhere around about seven this year and something like a little bit less than that next year. So medium term, uh, that's fine. Last comment I'd say about China, it is the second biggest economy in the world. It grows at 7%. Its demand for commodities is very large. And in a very simple sense, it takes them a year and a half to create a new career. So it's a big economy. And then India is starting to pick up as well. Um, so lots of uh, confidence coming through the new Prime Minister, but growth rates around six and a half. So sort of a really mixed economy. Just one comment about commodity prices, particularly iron ore and um, oil. You know, what's behind it? Is it a crash in the world economy? No. Left-hand side is basically just showing Australian exports of iron ore. Um, and the growth rate in red is above 20%. BHP and Rio are basically flooding the market. Um, and so what's happening there is they know that there's a huge amount of supply coming on, and they're basically saying, well, we might as well supply it. Because essentially, uh, they can land iron ore into China sub 40 bucks a, uh, a tonne. Oil. Same sort of concept, what's happening there. If you can see the red line there, that's US production of oil. Very large increases in uh, the amount of rigs over there, and also you've got the shale coming on, and the fracking, etc. None of the others are prepared to basically blink. So if you like, Russia's trying to get as much as they can out, they've got a few problems, and the Saudis are basically saying, well, um, we're going to have some short-term pain for long-term gain. So the core message to me is these iron ore and um, oil prices are going to stay low for a long time because of the supply effect. Currency. I always say if I knew exactly what was going to happen to the currency, I wouldn't be working. Paris is a really nice place. We run fundamental models of where the Australian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar is. Things that matter are particularly commodity prices, um, things like interest rates, relative levels of unemployment, but also how strong is the US dollar? Because whilst it might be a lot more expensive to go to the US as a tourist, it's not that much more expensive to go to Europe. And what we're really seeing is that given the falls in commodity prices and the falls in Australian terms of trade, the dollar around 77 is roughly where it should be. And as we go forward, our expectations are the Australian dollar will probably go a bit lower. Um, US, you're going to have increase in rates. We're still having rate cuts here. And um, they're essentially capital is flowing back into the US and it's going to continue. So our sort of views, I think, are probably not dissimilar to ABEAR.
but we have basically 74 this year and maybe a bit higher next year. What that means in Australian dollar terms is if you look on the left hand side there, black is sort of um, what's happening in US dollar terms and there's been some big falls. In Australian dollar terms, what we're saying is that weaker currency will roughly offset the fall in income in Australian dollars, but you've still got quite significant reductions in the terms of trade. Just a few comments about where are we today. Um, this is out of our business surveys. So red is business confidence. That spike in the middle of the graph there was the change of government last year. You're probably fair to say that business didn't like the previous government and the uncertainties. But as you go forward, uh, what we see is business confidence starting to erode away. The red dotted line across the middle there is long run average. So we've got a situation where confidence is below long run average. It's not disastrous, but it's um, below. The blue line is probably to some extent more important. That's how did you actually go? What your outcomes were? Um, and they've been getting better over the last 12 months. They spiked up in October, which we're not sure why, but then they've sort of faded away. So the sort of story is both confidence and business conditions are quite weak. Very different according to which industry. Red is confidence, blue is essentially conditions, and you think zero is roughly the sort of uh, trend line. Um, so if you're just drawing out a few things there, mining, and particularly mining services, are very nervous. So the big guys are hurting the small guys, and also you're not building as many mines anymore. And so that's having a big impact in confidence. Um, manufacturing is still struggling, as is wholesale. Retail is still struggling, although they're hoping that the rate cuts um, are basically going to make life better. So far, I don't think that's true, but they're hoping. And then the better sectors tend to be recreation and personal service, the consumer buying services. They've got money. That's what they'll, and if they need to do things like education, utility bills, they will. Um, strength in the finance sector, very strong confidence in construction. Construction, you have to be a bit careful. There's a boom going on in apartments, but construction also covers the construction of mines. So you've got sort of two effects there. The other thing that I think is important when you're thinking about Australia is because you're not getting very much growth in personal income and you're getting reductions in profits, what you get is the disposable income flowing through the economy is actually turned negative. And I suspect when we put the national accounts out tomorrow, you'll get another negative out of that. So there's not a lot of income around for a consumer and the price effects are having big impacts in terms of company profits. So as we go forward, I think there's three challenges fix affecting the Australian economy. Number one has been there for a while, and that is mining investment. You're moving from a period where there was a large amount of investment in new mines to a period where you're not going to be invest so much and you're going to export. Now, from a GDP point of view, in the mining sector, that's neutral. But the size there shows you as a percent of GDP the extent of the fall you're going to have in mining investment, and it's roughly half of total investment. So the big issue for Australia is unless you get the non-mining sector to accelerate, particularly in investment, or if you like filling the hole, you get GDP looks great because you've got all this growth in exports going on. So it'll generate 2% growth for you. But the rest of the economy will only grow at one. So the number one issue is why are we keeping rates low and people talking about rate cuts? Well, basically because you're trying to stimulate the non-mining sector because otherwise you have this big problem. Second issue is the iron ore price, which I said is supply. From a GDP point of view, it's actually adding to growth because what we're doing is we're increasing huge amounts of volume, but the price comes down and the net income that's generated is down about $30 billion per year. Okay, so if you think about that over what they call the forward estimates and the budget planning and you're taking 20% roughly in terms of company tax out of that or revenue or royalties, you lose something like $30 billion over four years for government revenue. You also have very significant impacts in terms of wealth in, in sort of the equity markets in those areas. Um, you have a lot of uncertainty and it's quite negative in the short term. The oil price shock is positive, offsetting that, 
but the timing is different. Oil price shocks take quite a long time to come through. If I'm sort of adding all these things up, the first thing I get is a big fall of inflation. So you're going to see uh, a big fall in the CPI when it comes out in a couple of months' time. Um, we're expecting the 12 months to growth inflation to be flat in core inflation around one and three quarters percent. So that's below the Reserve Bank's target. Incomes are much lower, as I said. The government can't sort of spend as much. It reduces some demand for investment if there's less income floating around. And it also makes people nervous, which flows into how much investment you're going to do. I think the consumer will have more money because of the fall in the oil price, but just at present, what they're going to do is they're going to pay the banks back. So they're putting it in the banks. Um, and the other thing you'll get eventually, if you get rate cuts, is you'll get some increased investment in dwellings. And then finally, what I was saying before is major trading partner growth for Australia will actually benefit. So if I'm sort of adding them all together, the sort of growth forecast we had is um, the dotted line that was at the end of last year. Where are we today? Um, you can see we have sort of have a, a sharper V in terms of these growth numbers. And so tomorrow we get the GDP for what, for what it's worth, we're expecting about half a percent. The other thing, as I said, inflation. There's the 12 months to growth. The blue is the actual, the red is sort of some fancy models we all use, including the Reserve Bank's version. And the sort of bottom line is for the next six months or so, they're right at the bottom. They sort of improve a little bit next year, but there's no sign of core inflation going anywhere near the top of the target range. So that gives you the issue about rates. The consumer, just as a general comment, uh, savings rates on the left-hand side. Savings rates in Australia are unusual in the sense that they went from practically nothing way up high when the global financial crisis and essentially have stayed there. Most of the rest of the world, those savings rates have come back down to normal. So the Australian consumer is still very nervous and worried. And you see it also when you ask them about what are you worried about, they all say number one thing is cost of living. And then you go underneath it and say, what's driving your cost of living? And the red bars there, I don't know if you can read the, the um, bits, but the things that they really hate are utility, education, housing, finance, transport, sort of things you've got to have. What don't they care about up in the blue? They don't worry about overseas travel, they don't worry about entertainment, and they don't worry about keeping up with the Joneses. This is very much a, an environment where, yes, you, you're giving a consumer more ability to spend, but he may not do it, or she. Housing, a lot of people talk about housing. Um, the graph on the left-hand side just gives you some numbers. It's mainly a Sydney-Melbourne story. And particularly in um, Melbourne, you're seeing some on the right-hand side, some of the heat coming out of the market. It's still very strong in Sydney, but there's a very big shortage of supply in Sydney, and it's an investor market. So the argument about using interest rates to just kill the investor market in Sydney and Melbourne is a bit more tricky because if you go outside those cities, it's a much weaker housing market. And in terms of our expectations, the left-hand side just shows some fancy models that sort of say something around about 5% growth in house prices. Uh, we're actually a bit weaker than that in our own forecast. The other way we can sort of look at housing price, we go out and we ask 400 professionals, what do you, what do you think? And they actually think about 2%. They're very bearish in the West, which is the sort of blue line. So overall, what I'm saying is housing, we expect to slow, and it is slowing now, and it will continue to slow. One thing that's not slowing is basically the investment in apartments that's going on. If you look on the left-hand side, the black line shows the number of houses that are approved by local government, and then the dark red line there is the number of apartments. For the last 30 years, four houses get approved for one apartment. Where are we today? It's almost one for one. Okay? And if the, the sort of pinky line underneath that, they're apartments that are more than four storeys. So what's really happening in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, they're building towers of apartments and a lot of it is foreign. Um, you just had some changes in the law, but we, no one knows exactly how much because previously you didn't have to go to Foreign Investment Review Board if it's new. But in grey bars there are about 16% of new apartments, we think, all the developers who are producing it say are by, by foreigners, and the black line that's going through the roof there, Melbourne, where they're talking somewhere north of 30% of every new apartment 
is, is foreign. Now, whilst you have a lot of social implications there about whether they turn the lights on, et cetera, et cetera, they are building them and they're going to keep building them for a while. So if you like, some of the constructors that were previously building mines are now building apartments. So that's sort of some of the adjustment. The other thing, and this is a sort of an attempt to say, why are we worried about the mining or non-mining investment coming back? This is capacity utilisation. The black dots are showing where capacity utilisation currently are in January. Um, the zero line is the long run average, and the red bars there are where they've been over the last five years. And as a rough rule, construction is above capacity utilisation. So is finance and business services. The rest of them essentially are below capacity. So what that means is if you're not that certain about what things are happening and you get an increase in demand, all you do is run your machine faster. You don't go out and borrow. You don't go out and invest more. And so that's the dynamic that I think Australia is facing. So we get this sort of problem. Red is GDP, blue is domestic demand. And so unless you're owning an LNG platform or an iron ore mine or a coal mine or whatever, you're living in a world of 1%. 1% growth is not enough domestically to generate enough jobs to keep unemployment where it is. So left-hand side there, we just have a long-run uh, relationship between growth of employment in our survey and what the statistician's publishing the key message is there is we lead, our series leads by about six months, and it's sort of saying, on average, you're going to generate 15,000 jobs a month. You need somewhere north of 20 to keep unemployment where it is. And so what we get in the blue line on the right-hand side is unemployment going up to about 6.6, 6, 6 7, compared to where we are today. Oh, just went off. Um, the, the last thing I was going to say was on interest rates, uh, I think the Reserve Bank is nervous because they're looking to lower their basic uh, growth numbers. They have very low inflation. And as we look forward, they're basically saying, well, the economy is not picking up like we were hoping it would and we're going to give it some help. So that's what I think they did in February. I don't know what they're going to do this afternoon, but I do know that sometime in the next couple of months they'll be cutting again. And our view is there's probably a 30% chance they'll cut twice more this year. Um, that's going to depend on where the unemployment level is and as we go forward, what's going to... The only thing that's sort of offsetting that is if house prices start to re-accelerate. So my sort of bottom line on the Australian economy is it's OK. It's not going to be as good as the GDP numbers look and the Reserve Bank is probably quite concerned about trying to give a bit of a stimulus. Stop there. Thank you.